So we've just done covering the 18th century and what might be termed best as the first American Revolution, the, the first American Revolution that is kind of bound up in the Declaration of Independence is a revolution that took place because we had been used to employing self-rule in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, we were won over by, th by this idea that it would be great to establish a republican form of government, uh, uh, the opposite of a despotic form of government. Uh, thirdly, that that republican form of government should operate on uh, liberal principles of political philosophy, that we are equal and free, that we've been endowed that way by our creator, and that we ought to be able to pursue our happiness using our reason and laboring and nature uh, and so on. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, Jefferson's great kind of bringing together all of these traditions uh, with the umbrella of, of Christianity uh, and to make the case for American Revolution uh, to the opinions of mankind respectfully. So this first American Revolution is of, of great interest to us understanding the story of American civilization and culture. But I would also argue that there's a second American Revolution that takes place. And it's the revolution that takes place in between the Declaration of Independence and the establishment of the U.S. Constitution. So to want your freedom and to want to rule over yourself is one thing. To want a republic is one thing. To want to declare your independence, those are all democratic impulses. But how do you do that in a constitutional manner? How do you create a constitutional republic, a republic kind of held together by clear notions of how power ought to be distributed across the board? Uh, what power should the one have, the few and the many? These are the questions on the minds of what I would call that second series of American revolutionaries. So I want to begin with an excerpt from a great book. I've referenced it before. It's titled Freedom Just Around the Corner, and it's by the great historian Walter McDougall. And in this chapter, or at least at the beginning of this chapter, titled The Coup That Begat the Constitution, he takes a look at the lives of two individuals who were very instrumental uh, to the passage of the U.S. Constitution, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. So he starts out by taking a look at James Madison. He mentions that Madison was, was short, he was sickly, uh, he was from Virginia, uh, but he was brought up in a family that valued education and so valued education that they wanted to send Madison at that time far away from home to Princeton, New Jersey to be educated by this new and very uh, interesting scholar slash theologian pastor who had moved over uh, from uh, England just some short time ago, this man named uh, John Witherspoon. Now, Witherspoon is, the, um, is the, the, the building that we are now in is Witherspoon Hall. It's named after Witherspoon, this first president of Princeton University. And what makes uh, Witherspoon an interesting character and, and what type of influence does he have on Madison? Well, McDougall argues that Witherspoon was an incredibly interesting intellect because his mind was shaped by two things that he believed were not antithetical to one another. The first was Reformed theology and Calvinism, this idea right, that man is a fallen being, right, that we are, um, we are left unto ourselves more than likely to fall prey to sin. So this recognition, this humble recognition of our need of a savior uh, to come into our lives, to help us with that part of our heart that is sinful and that part of our nature that is sinful. So this, this reticence about human nature kind of found in Calvinist theology, mixed with a second influence that finds its way in to Witherspoon's mind and spirit, and that is uh, the Scottish Enlightenment. So who were the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers and, and what did they think? Well, they recognized, much like uh, Calvinists, that, that man is not perfect, that you can never find a perfect human being. But they don't look to the Bible, per se, to tell you that. They say, look to common sense. Have you ever met any individual in this world who is perfect? So what I'm saying to you here is the Scottish Enlightenment thinker settles upon this notion that human beings are imperfect and common sense tells us so. 
and this reform notion, right, that we have fallen prey to sin. So how do the confluence of these two things find their way into Witherspoon's person? And then how did he lead Princeton thereafter? And what influence did this have upon Madison? Well, Witherspoon believed that reason and revelation ought not to be considered enemies to one another. But both things brought together can give us a optimal picture of what we're up against as human beings and an optimal portrait of what we need to do in order to make things better. And it's this balance that Witherspoon says is present within reason and revelation that draws the same picture of the world that can act as a guide to us as we try to bring balance and stability to the world. So Madison, training under Witherspoon in moral philosophy, sees that perhaps the great role of the statesman is to try to encourage balance in a situation that is out of balance. So you see in Madison's writings around the Constitution, this constant um, um, mention of the idea of how can we, in distributing power here or there, check one force against another? How can we create a political world that is as much in alignment as the world that God has created, the planets and the solar system uh, conducting their business and in motion in a way in which everything is held together. So Madison, the father of the Constitution, interested in balance, taught that we can have within our power the ability to create a balanced political scheme. Well, how about Hamilton? Hamilton of a very different origin than Madison, uh, grew up an orphan. He's brought to New York City, um, studies at the King's College in, in New York City, uh, and thereafter uh, sets, says to himself that he wants to be that individual that crafts institutions that allow others to flourish just as he's flourished in this young nation. And what that means is it means that perhaps we can put into place uh, the establishment of a modern science of politics uh, that better helps humankind kind of come together and live together, uh, albeit our shortcomings uh, as human beings. So a Madison who's brought to this project out of a desire for balance, a Hamilton who's brought to this project out of a desire to do unto others has been done, has, has been done unto him in his own livelihood. These two, as we'll see in future uh, discussions, will be instrumental in not only designing the features of the American Constitution, but arguing for them in the Federalist Papers.